In this video, we're going to go through some examples of the SN2 reaction just so that we can see that we're, um, just so we can get some practice, get more comfortable predicting the products for SN2 reactions, proposing the mechanism, um, that sort of thing. Okay, so with our notes in front of us, let's start with, um, let's start with, oh, this. Okay, so the question is predict the products. Um, and uh, because usually I wouldn't couple these in the same question, but uh, for practice, let's go ahead and try to propose a mechanism in addition to predicting the products. So what we first want to recognize is that the nucleophile has come as a potassium salt. So our nucleophilic atom is going to be the oxygen with the negative charge. It's not always the oxygen, it's just whatever atom was um, is usually shown as directly, I quote, directly ionically bonded to the metal um, counter ion. And then um, our electrophile is the haloalkane. And the um, electrophilic carbon, I'll show with a dot, that's the carbon that's directly attached to the bromine and has a delta plus. Okay, so the negative charge on the oxygen is going to come and attack the bromine we will see backside attack and inversion of the tetrahedral center, but there's no stereochemistry to worry about. So what I am going to do is show the bond being formed. So our new bond is between the nucleophilic atom and the uh, um, electrophilic carbon. And as we add, we push the Br minus off, and so this is our product, or we could draw it a little bit more zigzaggy. Just want to make sure you don't lose track of your carbon atoms along the way. So if we have one, two, three from the dot, we want to make sure that we have one, two, three being added on to our nucleophilic position. Okay. So there's one example. Let's show another example. I'll try to use some wild examples here. So here's an example where the nucleophile is not a heteroatom, is not a, um, is a carbon atom, okay? And so what we can do is just cross out the potassium with a K and replace it with the negative charge on carbon. Now that negative charge is going to be attracted to the carbon that's directly attached to the halogen in our electrophile. And so that's going to be this atom on the cyclohexane to give us this molecule and the nucleophile that we added in that case was cyanide. And so if we drew it as a bond line structure without the C, we would have a triple bond from the carbon atom to the nitrogen. Maybe I'll draw that a little bit bigger so that we can follow it easily. Okay, there it is a little bit bigger. So this is the cyanide uh, nucleophile. And some of these nucleophiles can be fairly bizarre, but um, they provide interesting products. So let's say that we have this molecule and we react it with NaN3. This is sodium azide. And so in this reaction, we simply cross out the um, sodium and replace the nitrogen with a negative charge. There are three nitrogens together. They could be um, so we have now one plus and I think I prefer this this resonance structure. Excuse me. This this depiction is a little bit easier to follow. So it's overall N3 minus one because one of the negative charges cancels out. But 
Either way, the negative charge now is going to attack the carbon that's directly attached to the bromine atom, push it off and we get this product. Okay. What we can also consider are halogens. So halogens can be nucleophiles. That is, we could have chlorine, bromine, iodine. You could see all of these um, behave as nucleophiles. So it turns out that um, iodine is a better nucleophile than bromine and which is a better nucleophile than chlorine. So if you mixed ethyl bromide plus sodium iodide with some good SN2 solvent, what would happen is the iodine would actually serve as a good nucleophile, add to the carbon that's directly attached to the bromine, and then that carbon will lose the bromine atom to give rise to this molecule here, plus Br minus. Okay, so you really only wanna consider this if I, if I actually clearly hand you a nucleophile that's the sodium or potassium salt of a halogen, okay? There's always a halogen byproduct present. Um, yeah, anyway. So this is just another example of something to kind of keep in mind. Okay, we could also have neutral nucleophiles. Neutral nucleophiles, and they could be like NR3 with a lone pair or PR3, phosphorus lone pair and electrons. Um, these have a little bit of a twist to them. The product is going to be positively charged for us. And you'll see why that is in a second. Okay, so let's say that I take bromoethane again and react it with this molecule it turns out that the lone pair of electrons is sufficiently a sufficiently strong nucleophile to add to the brom excuse me add to the carbon and push off the bromine to give rise to this structure plus Br negative. So it's always a lone pair of electrons that's doing the attacking in these SN2 reactions. We usually draw the arrow starting from the charge instead of the lone pair, but realize it's just an extra lone pair on those oxygen atoms that gives the atom a negative formal charge. We could start from the lone pair of electrons and that might be more accurate. There's always enough inaccuracies with this model of thinking that I don't worry about it too much, but now we have a neutral nucleophile, so no charge to start the arrow from. Instead, we're gonna go directly from the lone pair of electrons and add to the carbon atom with the bromine. Now what's important is we want to maintain a constant charge on the left and right side of the chemical reaction equation. Now we're neutral on the left. And if you look, we're negative one on the right. Now what's happened is the phosphorus in this case is actually positively charged. If you wanted to check that, you could do a formal charge calculation on phosphorus. So phosphorus is in group um, uh, uh, five, excuse me, five five minus four minus zero equals a plus one charge. So we've got a plus one charge for the formal charge on phosphorus, and that's actually going to cancel out the negative one charge on the bromine atom that's being formed. And we have a neutral product to, cons uh, a neutral um, right side of the chemical reaction equation. So this can be the case with phosphorus or nitrogen Okay, so there's no sodium salt in here. And so, or potassium or whatever. So we have to just consider the lone pair of electrons that's on the nitrogen atom. 
Those will attack the carbon that's directly attached to the iodine, push the iodine off, and that will give rise to this structure plus I minus. And what we have to do is recognize that to neutralize the negative charge, um, we have to have a positive charge. That's because the left and right side of the chemical reaction need to have the same charge, overall charge. Overall neutral on the left needs to be balanced by overall neutral on the right. But just as with phosphorus up above, we could have a we could do a formal charge calculation. Math works out the same. Group five minus four bonds minus zero electrons is equal to plus one again. Okay, so um, there's more practice with the discussion problem sets. Just keep working through those. Look at more examples of this. This is a, a really important reaction in chemistry. I can't um, overstate that. And so, you know, understanding the reaction will be really helpful uh, going forward. Um, so go ahead, keep, uh, keep chugging away at practicing this uh, reaction.